Bienvenidos a la temporada número 17 de La Oveja Eléctrica, un espacio que estimula la imaginación y el conocimiento con las nuevas vistas que abre la ciencia para tratar de entender nuestro universo y transformar nuestras vidas mediante el desarrollo del pensamiento inteligente, creativo y generoso. Y justamente en estos tiempos, el telescopio James Webb está capturando imágenes asombrosas, imágenes muy lejanas, algunas de ellas de hace 13 mil millones de años, y su luz impacta el día de hoy a nuestras retinas con estas fotografías que nos hacen asomar a nuestro pasado, que nos hacen acercarnos al origen del universo, nuestro origen, el Big Bang, que se estima que ocurrió hace 13.800 millones de años. Y nosotros somos el instrumento para que las estrellas conozcan su belleza. Y hoy vamos a conversar con Neil Turok, destacado físico teórico, quien trabajó con Stephen Hawking en la Universidad de Cambridge, tratando de descifrar el misterio del inicio del universo, del Big Bang. De acuerdo con Turok, los cálculos que realizó junto con Hawking tienen inconsistencias que lo convierten en el más grande rompecabezas de la ciencia. Turok plantea que hay suficiente evidencia para convencernos de que efectivamente hubo un Big Bang, pero desconocemos su mecanismo. Señala que para solventar el modelo que tenemos del Big Bang y de cómo funciona el universo, se añaden cada vez más teorías sobre partículas, dimensiones extras o campos invisibles. Pero a contracorriente del pensamiento predominante en estas áreas de conocimiento, este investigador apunta a una dirección menos complicada. Neil Turok is an innovative thinker. He's a renowned South African physicist. Neil is the director emeritus of the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics, who tries to understand the origin of our universe in simple and challenging ways to the contemporary models and paradigms. Among the books he has written, we have the titles Endless Universe Beyond the Big Bang with Paul Steinhardt and From Quantum to Cosmos, The Universe Within. Neil is also the founder of the South Africa-based African Institute for Mathematical Sciences, a work connected with his compromise with equal opportunities for gaining knowledge. Neil Turok, thank you very much for your presence in the Electric Ship Channel 22 in Mexico. Thank you very much for having me. You know, your thinking is shaped with the principles of simplicity, elegance, and beauty. Yes. I would like to explore first how this was ingrained in your early experiences. We are talking about the astonishing simplicity of everything, but yes. that gets cultivated since childhood. And then I had a wonderful teacher uh, in Tanzania who was a volunteer teacher from Scotland, where I now live, actually. And, um, and she... Um, comes from a long tradition in Scotland of fundamental thinking. I mean, you may know that many of the pioneers in modern science originated in a period called the Scottish Enlightenment, where essentially they questioned everything in the 17th century. They tried to go back to first principles <clears throat> about everything. You know, how do we understand the world? What, what is mathematics? Um, and out of there came James Clerk Maxwell, who, of course, founded modern physics because he discovered how electricity and magnetism work and he explained what light is. And that led to the understanding of radio waves and X-rays and so on. So um, the, the, the roots of modern physics and modern science had, if you like, uh, affected my own teacher, who taught me when I was, um, you know, six, seven, eight years old. And uh, so I absorbed some of that from her. Mm. But the other focus, the other reason I've learned to focus on simplicity is because the other approach does not work. Okay. <laughs> and what maybe distinguishes me from the other theoretical physicists in my generation 
is I actually want to know the answer. And I believe that nature tells us we should not impose our ideas on nature. Rather, we come up with ideas and um, uh, conjectures and speculations, especially theorists. But ultimately, we have to test those against reality. And the universe tells us whether our ideas are right or wrong. So when I was a young scientist, I preferred to study testable theories. You know, I wanted to study, well, not just testable, but theories which are based on profound principles, elegant principles, um, mathematics which makes real predictions. And then I wanted to confront them with reality. Hmm. Around in the 1980s, I pursued an exciting set of ideas about the very early universe connected with grand unified theories. And uh, there were various predictions that were made. And I pursued these more seriously than most of my contemporaries. And I end up, ended up proving these ideas wrong, okay? So I spent two decades proving those ideas wrong. And whereas my contemporaries were moving on to even more complicated ideas, not just grand unified theories, but superstring theory and M theory and extra dimensions, each one of which introduced new ingredients and made it less testable. And, and so they continued in this vein and they didn't worry too much about uh, observations. And their ideas were not disproved and that encouraged them. But the reason they were not disproved is because they were not disprovable. <laughs> okay, <laughs> their theories were too complicated. So in other words, it, it took me some time to realize that what the universe is telling us is actually something very simple. It's still a puzzle, but the solution of that puzzle will be a profound uh, theoretical idea, which explains a lot at once. Like, and, a haiku, uh, like a haiku in a few lines okay. captures the essence of something. Exactly. In the rompecabezas del Big Bang, the physicist Neil Turok busca una solución elegante. ¿Cuál fue el detonador de esta búsqueda? De ello hablaremos después del corte. Mientras tanto, pasamos a una sección con nuestra querida compañera Aura López, que nos habla de las investigaciones de vanguardia que se realizan en nuestro país. Pues querida Aura, es un gusto encontrarnos nuevamente en este espacio de la oveja eléctrica en la nueva temporada. Ay, muchas gracias, Pepe. Una gran emoción para mí. Oye, y les quiero contar que algo que no debemos dejar de pasar es visitar el Jardín Etnobiológico en la Ciudad de México, que forma parte de la red de jardines etnobiológicos impulsada por Conacit. Y es curioso descubrir que ahí hay una colección de plantas medicinales que se citan en documentos antiguos como el Códice de la Cruz Badiano, que es el primer tratado que describió la propiedad curativa de las plantas usadas por los mexicas y que surgió en el año 1552. Pues bien, esto se los cuento porque probablemente cuando van por primera vez a un jardín, su primera impresión es que es verde, bonito y tiene plantas, pero cuando descubres el valor de las plantas, se te activa una chispa que te hace pensar de dónde vienen, para qué sirven, cuál es su historia. De ahí que la Red de Jardines Etnobiológicos del CONACIT, un proyecto hecho con la colaboración de universidades e instituciones educativas del país, busque impulsar la riqueza biocultural de México y fortalecer e incluir a las comunidades campesinas, ya sean mestizas, indígenas o afromexicanas, que están comprometidas a la protección de la agrobiodiversidad de México, como por ejemplo en la conservación genética del maíz, el frijol y y la calabaza, además de fomentar el diálogo circular de saberes en salud, ambiente, botánica, zoología, ecología y organización social, entre otros temas.
Son 26 jardines etnobiológicos los que forman parte de la red del Consejo Nacional de Ciencia y Tecnología y que logran el cuidado de la flora y fauna a través de apiarios, herbarios, invernaderos comunitarios, bancos de semillas, colecciones de plantas medicinales, agaves y arbustivas, entre otras. Dense una vuelta a los Jardines Etnobiológicos de México y conozcan de primera mano la labor del CONACYT en la preservación del valor cultural y ambiental que tiene nuestro país. Y bueno, pues es claro que un jardín encantado siempre es más que un jardín. En un parpadeo cósmico volvemos a la oveja eléctrica. de rayo con tintes verdes y dorados que trata de iluminar los orígenes del universo, estamos de regreso en la oveja eléctrica conversando con el destacado físico teórico Neil Turok para tratar de armar el rompecabezas del origen del cosmos con un modelo del mecanismo del Big Bang y del desarrollo del universo más simple y elegante. El detonador de esta búsqueda fue una de esas preguntas simples que a veces nadie se atreve a formular. So I, after this experience of finding complicated, you know, more complicated, messy ideas disproved, I just decided to devote myself to finding the simple ideas. And we have some, we have some. We don't know if they're correct yet, but they are testable and they will be tested and if they are correct we're really going to make a big advance in our understanding of the universe and and one of these ideas uh, is uh, it has to do with uh, the big bang as the greatest yeah. puzzle in all science yes and that for you was awakened with a very simple and basic question yes. about the big bang asked by your mathematical ma mathematics teacher from yeah. primary school Let's Very talk good. about it, please. So she is the same person I mentioned before. Yes. Oh. <laughs> uh, she was from Edinburgh and um, dedicated her life to teaching. And, um, but I got in touch with her much later when I was a professor in Cambridge. I was working with Stephen Hawking and he, may, he had a TV program where it featured me. And she saw me on the TV show. And she wrote me a letter. She said, are you the same person who was <laughs> <laughs> in my class in primary school? And uh, I was uh, really thrilled. One of the happiest days of my life to be reunited with this teacher. And so I came to visit her in Edinburgh and she asked me, what are you doing? I said, I'm working on the Big Bang. I'm trying to understand what happened. Uh, and I started to get technical. And she said, no, 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 I don't want the technical story. She said, I have a very simple question, uh, which I ask of every astronomer, astrophysicist who comes to lecture in Edinburgh. I always ask the same question and nobody can answer it. I say, okay, what's the question? She says, what banged? <laughs> <laughs> what has exploded? What banged? You know, people talk about the Big Bang, but there's no explanation for what banged. So I said, that's exactly right. There is no explanation. Uh, we're, that is exactly the question I'm trying to answer. So the fact she could put it so simply and captured the essence of the problem was great encouragement to me. Um, just to elaborate, it is the most profound paradox in science that everything we see around us, the, the earth, the planets, the galaxy, the stars, every single thing, these are described very, very accurately by Einstein's theory of gravity. And it seems to work. Every time we test it, it works. So it predicted black holes, and these were discovered. Uh, 10 years ago, we started to see black holes. We can literally see them now. We see the gravitational waves they emit when they spiral into each other. So Einstein's theory is one of the most solid parts of science that we have. But according to this theory, 
the whole universe, if we came from a point, a single point of zero size, and that's the Big Bang. So as we go back in time, the universe gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And 14 billion years ago, the whole universe was one point. And so everything came from a point. Very and dense. That, it, it, extremely dense point where no equations in physics work. Okay, so this is the ultimate crazy paradox, uh, which is indeed what I am trying to explain. And uh, various people have made uh, speculations about what happened at the Big Bang. ¿Qué es lo que pasó en el Big Bang? ¿Qué es lo que impulsó el Big Bang? Como dice la canción del programa de televisión de Big Bang Theory en el que sale Sheldon Cooper, todo nuestro universo estaba en un estado caliente y denso y luego hace casi 14 mil millones de años comenzó la expansión. La Tierra comenzó a enfriarse. Los autótrofos comenzaron a babear. Los neandertales desarrollaron herramientas. Construimos murallas, pirámides. Desarrollamos matemáticas, ciencia, historia. Desentrañamos misterios. Pero todo empezó con el Big Bang. Ahora bien, esa gran explosión no fue precisamente una explosión, sino una vasta expansión de material extremadamente condensado. La historia tradicional del Big Bang nos dice que el tiempo y el espacio se formaron cuando tras ese fenómeno el universo se expandió miles de millones de veces su tamaño original. Esto se realizó mediante un proceso conocido como inflación cosmológica. El problema es que Stephen Hawking y Neil Turok se encontraron con ciertas inconsistencias en este modelo. De ello hablaremos después del corte. de rayo con tintes verdes y dorados, estamos de regreso en los escenarios cósmicos de la oveja eléctrica para hablar del más grande rompecabezas de la ciencia. ¿Cómo entender el origen y el desarrollo del universo? ¿Lo que pasó en el Big Bang? Estamos conversando con el físico teórico Neil Turok sobre el trabajo que realizó en torno a este problema junto con el gran físico Stephen Hawking, una labor infructuosa que llevó a Turok a a revisar la idea de un proceso conocido como la inflación, en donde el universo se hinchó repentinamente miles de billones de veces más que su tamaño original. ¿Cómo se disparó ese proceso? Su idea se basa en la noción de un universo que funciona en su origen de una manera asombrosamente simple, sin tener que añadir variables al gusto para explicar su desarrollo. Uh, Stephen Hawking had a very beautiful idea, but uh, about uh, five years ago, uh, myself and my students, we studied this in more detail. Uh, I worked with Stephen, so I understood the idea quite well, but we did more mathematical work and we convinced ourselves this fails. It, 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 his idea is mathematically inconsistent, unfortunately, very beautiful idea but it's just logically inconsistent. So now we have an alternative proposal, which is very simple mathematically, and ultimately will be testable in observations and also just logically to see if it, it has any uh, you know, inconsistencies. And uh, so that's what I'm excited about now. We have a new approach to the Big Bang. What's wrong from your perspective with our current understanding of the Big Bang? Right. And what is your take? So it's extremely interesting situation because theoretical physics and, uh, and fundamental physics is a very successful area of science. We, according to this picture, in the early universe, there was a very complicated, um, situation, basically a big mess. If you imagine a universe which is very lumpy and expanding in different ways everywhere, uh, and um, everything is chaotic, that's the picture behind inflation. And then you introduce some extra form of energy, which nobody has ever seen, called inflationary energy. 
And what this does is it blows up the universe. Literally, it's the dynamite to blow it up to explain the Big Bang. And you might say, great, it explains the Big Bang because now we know what exploded, it's inflationary energy. Now, my problem with that always has been that you introduced it by hand. <laughs> you just didn't, There's no evidence for it. You assumed it. It was not based on any principle. It was just an ingredient you chose to put there to solve a problem. Secondly, you had to assume it was in a particular state in order to solve that problem. You know, so you're making more and more and more assumptions. In fact, the number of assumptions you have to introduce to explain the Big Bang are more, are many more than what we see are necessary to describe the universe today. You know, the universe, when we observe it today, is amazingly simple. To describe, just amazing. You map the universe on the largest possible scale, and you find that it's much simpler than, let's say, a bacterium. You know, take a bacteria, uh -huh, uh -huh. a single bacterium. It's quite a complicated object. You know, it has its DNA and it has all kinds of molecules and it, it can be active and swim in water and so on. This one bacterium is much more complicated than the large scale universe. The large scale universe we can describe, it obeys the laws of physics beautifully, we can predict what we see. And I had in my own career, a good fortune to calculate a particular thing you can observe in the large scale universe. It's called the polarization of the radiation from the Big Bang. And me and my students were the first people ever to calculate this. And we calculated it on the basis of very simple input, calculated it before the observations were made. Then uh, astronomers came and constructed incredible satellites and very sensitive instruments, measured the polarization of the radiation from the Big Bang, and it just agrees perfectly. Okay, no adjustable versus like this. It's crazy we can really understand what's going on on astronomical scales much more easily. We can't predict the weather on the Earth, <laughs> you know, but, um, but we can predict the structure of the universe with amazing precision. So it's, we li my conclusion from this is that we live, we're very, very fortunate. We live in an incredibly simple universe which is understandable. We don't know why. We have no idea why. Einstein but said it, yes. It's incredible how we can comprehend. We can't comprehend. We are in the middle. Vivimos en un universo increíblemente simple, nos dice el físico Neil Turok, que no necesita invocar multiversos o un mayor número de dimensiones y que podría explicar de una manera sencilla la materia oscura que conforma el 85% del universo. Para Turok, en vez de añadir ingredientes, la clave para entender los misterios del universo está en fijarse en la asombrosa sencillez, belleza, elegancia y economía de la naturaleza. El físico teórico señala que somos el medio que tiene el universo para conocerse a sí mismo, y en ello se juegan fascinantes principios simétricos. En la próxima emisión de La Oveja Eléctrica, conversaremos con Neil Turok sobre la posibilidad de que en el espejo del Big Bang encontremos un antiuniverso. No se lo pierdan. Y ahora pasamos al espejo y las simetrías entre arte y ciencia con nuestra querida compañera Miriam Moscona. Me he quedado de piedra al descubrir que eh, una poeta latinoamericana ha dado su nombre a toda una región del cielo. Creo que si ella pudiera saberlo, eh, se iba a ir para atrás. De eso trata nuestra colaboración el día de hoy, Pepe, y de otras cosas. Esta brillante nube cósmica fue esculpida por los vientos estelares y por la radiación de las estrellas jóvenes y calientes del cúmulo abierto llamado NGC 3324. 
se encuentra a unos 7500 años luz de distancia hacia la rica nebulosa de la constelación del sur de Carina. Se trata de un paisaje celeste de brillantes crestas de emisión, bordeadas por el frío y oscuro polvo que se extiende a lo largo de la nube cósmica. El nombre popular de la región que forma estrellas es Gabriela Mistral Nebula, en honor a la gran poeta chilena Gabriela Mistral. Si supiera que su nombre está en el espacio sideral, se quedaría muda. Eta Carinae es una estrella binaria luminosa azul y permasiva situada en la constelación de la Quilla. Su masa oscila entre 100 y 150 veces la masa solar. Eso la convierte en una de las estrellas más grandes conocidas en nuestra galaxia. Tiene una altísima luminosidad de alrededor de 4 millones de veces la del Sol, debido a la gran cantidad de polvo que la rodea. Eta Carina irradia el 99% de su luminosidad en la parte infrarroja del espectro, y eso la convierte en la más brillante del cielo. La belleza de imágenes que nos trae nuestra querida compañera Miriam Moscona. Y es la hora de los cantos cuánticos en donde nuestro querido Fernando Rivera Calderón le canta al Big Bang con todo su corazón. Mi querido Fernando Rivera Calderón, es un gusto encontrarnos en la nueva temporada de La Oveja Eléctrica. 17 temporadas, que no es nada desde el Big Bang, ¿no? pero bueno, ahí está. Que hace la nada en la nada, pues nada, nada. pues nada. nada. Que hace la nada en la nada, pues nada, pues, pues nada. nada. La nada nadando hace nada, nadando hace nada y nada. La nada nadando hace nada, nadando hace nada y nada. De tanto nadar, la nada se deprimió, yo nada valgo. De tanto nadar, la nada ya comenzó a volverse algo. Algo. Y ya no queda nada, 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 n